Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Panos Dafas, uh, treasurer and uh, trustee of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain. On behalf of the executive committee, I'm uh, happy to welcome you on our first live webinar this evening. Before we start, uh, let me say a few words about our society, mainly for our new guests. The Macedonian Society of Great Britain was founded in London in 1989 by members of the Greek community originated, originating from a province of Macedonia in Northern Greece. The society is registered uh, UK charity and we are involved in organizing various educational and cult cultural events uh, with the purpose of promoting the history, culture and tradition of our Greek Macedonian heritage. Today, our main speaker and dear friend uh, of the society, Mrs. Vicky Price, will address the question Brexit, what will mean for the UK, Europe and Greece? Uh, so let me introduce Vicky before we start. So Vicky is an economist and business consultant. Her recent posts have included Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting, Director General for, Economist, for Economics at the, uh, at the Department of, for Business, Innovation and Skills, uh, so known BIS, and Joint Head of the UK Government Economic Service, where she was responsible for evidence-based evidence policy and for encouraging measures that promoted greater, greater productivity in the UK economy. She had previously been partner and chief economist at KPMG and earlier held, held chief economist positions in banking and oil sector. Vicky co-founded Good Corporation, a company set up to promote corporate social responsibility. At various stages in her career, she has been uh, on the Council of the Royal Economic Society, on the Council of the University of Kent, on the Board of Trustees at the RSA, on the Court of the London School of Economics, a Fellow of the Society of Business Economists, on the Executive Committee and the Council of the IFS, an Academician of the Academy of Social Sciences, a Visiting Professor at the Cass Business School, a Visiting Fellow at Nutfield College, Adjunct Professor at Imperial College, and visiting professor at Queen Mary University of London. She is a patron of pro bono economics and has, has served as master of one of the City of London's livery companies. She sits on the Department of, for Business Innovation and Skills panel, monitoring the economy, and is on uh, CTAM's Shadow Monetary Policy Committee a column that I very often used to read during my daily commute uh, to the office, but not very recently. Uh, so now, before we start, uh, just a few housekeeping points. So as, as you have probably noticed, uh, you as audience cannot really share your video in Zoom webinar, uh, webinars. However, part, uh, you can participate to polls and submit questions. So we are going to have two polls, one at the middle of the talk and one, one at the end, where you can all participate. Polls are anonymous, so feel free to give the answer you really want. Uh, so Mrs. Vicky Price will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can submit your question at any point during the seminar using the Q&A panel, uh, which you can find on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your mouse around or touch the screen of your iPad or iPhone, you'll see a Q&A uh, uh, button there. Uh, so should you wish to ask the question yourself by the microphone, you can click raise hand. So in that way, I'll, uh, I'll know if your question is selected to unmute your microphone so you can uh, ask your question yourself. Alternatively, we will read out your question, uh, your question loud and uh, Vicky will uh, answer it live. Now on the chat facility, you, you, you can find all this uh, kind of information now I just outlined. So I think that was it from my side. So without further ado, I give you Mrs. Vicky Price.
Well, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, very, very kind introduction, in fact. Um, of course, you didn't mention that I'm also Greek, Greek-born, or perhaps you did, and, uh, and I didn't hear it. Uh, but I have to admit that uh, I was born in Athens. So in a way, I'm a bit of an imposter, really. Um, but I know a number of you because I have uh, participated in quite a lot of events and spoken at uh, them or chaired or suggested other speakers. So I'm really quite uh, familiar with what you do. Plus, of course, I get invited to your amazing events over Christmas. But of course, I presume this year nothing very much is happening. So very sorry about that. But um, I look forward to future years. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to do today's talk. It's all about Brexit, of course, but we are in the middle of this coronavirus crisis, uh, not just us, but also Greece, of course. So um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to fall back a little bit on, my, uh, on the subject that I know probably better than anything else, which is economics, and then uh, try and link uh, with the, the Brexit debate to what may be happening to the economies in the future, whether it's the UK, European, or maybe even Greece. And there may again be a number of people in the audience who know an awful lot more about it than, than I do in terms of what's happening directly in Greece right now. I have some slides, but uh, hopefully in the question and answer session, we'll uh, be able to have a bit more of a chat on that. So what I'll do now is I'll share my screen. Um, I hope it works. It normally does, so. Right, so this is really what I wanted to talk about, and hopefully it will allow me to have the sideshow as well. Okay, so the title is indeed uh, a slightly likely impact on Britain and Greece, but uh, you have, of course, those of you who live here have uh, been uh, hearing that uh, you know, there's now a certain urgency in getting some sort of agreement, given that the end of the transition period from which we really become a third country is at the end of December, which is not very far at all. Uh, but of course, there have also been uh, suggestions that we could live with a no deal because after all, the coronavirus crisis is so big, it's going to hide any impact that Brexit may have, uh, it will certainly minimize it and uh, maybe we shouldn't worry about that too much. There have also been serious worries about what type of deal we may have. Is it going to be a thin deal? Is it going to be a quite a detailed one? Is it really going to open up uh, the access of British firms to Europe in a big way or is it still going to have to be negotiated in detail in the future? Are we ready for it at all or not? So I want to take you through that but of course whether we like it or not, uh, what the economy is doing more generally is going to have quite a substantial impact on what also happens when Brexit finally uh, you know, takes place at the beginning of January 2021 in, a, uh, in an effective way, in the sense that until now, everything had stayed more or less as it was, even though we left at the end of last year officially. So let's see what's happening to the economies and uh, remind ourselves where we each are. Uh, it is indeed true that coronavirus has had very substantial impact. You can see the latest forecast from the International Monetary Fund, which suggests uh, a fall of 4% for the world economy in 2020. I mean, those of us who were working with the government or for the government at the time of the financial crisis, uh, remember that uh, you know, we were extremely worried about how we would get out of it and spend loads and loads of money to ensure that we did. Um, and indeed, this is exactly what's happening right now. The forecast is that the world economy will recover quite substantially next year. Uh, however, if you look at the advanced economies, which is the set of bars in the middle, what you see is that, yes, we do recover, but rather more slowly than we would like. And we may not get back to where we were before until 2022. That does have repercussions in terms also of how we handle Brexit and what we think the implications of that might be. And as I said before, uh, there are suggestions that perhaps we don't need to worry about it because uh, coronavirus is so much more significant at present. But let's see what's been going on so far. I mean, remember, uh, the whole vaccine situation has only um, you know, become a reality in the last few days when uh, there is perhaps light at the end of the tunnel. All these forecasts may, of course, be revised. And that's the real problem, whether we're looking at the coronavirus impact or we're looking at the impact of Brexit itself. We just don't really know how fast uh, the, the vaccine 
uh, appearance is going to affect business confidence, consumer confidence, and therefore growth in all our countries, frankly. But there had been indeed huge amount of money that had been spent to get the economies out of the problem they were in. And you can see here, the overall direct fiscal stimulus has been something like 12 trillion dollars uh, so far, huge amount of quantitative easing, which is basically the central banks buying um, government bonds in the secondary market, allowing uh, countries to, to borrow a lot more. I mean, the interesting thing is that thinking about Greece and the problem it had after the financial crisis, um, it is borrowing more now like everyone else, but it's now considered to be acceptable uh, to do so. The, the National Monetary Fund is encouraging everyone to keep on borrowing and keep on spending. Uh, I wish they said that 10 years ago, but there we are. China, of course, recovered from it much faster than the rest of us, but you see that the global economy was getting better. Now, of course, since then, this is November data, there have been a few lockdowns introduced in November in a number of countries, and in some cases, even in October, and Greece has gone into lockdown as well. So that's going to slow things down a bit. And indeed, data from the last month or so suggests that we are into a slowdown. We can, you can see here what happened in the Eurozone, of which, of course, Greece is a member. Um, you saw the improvement that I showed you before, uh, but now we have a slowdown in, in the recovery, and the likelihood is that November was even slower. Remember, anything about 50s expansion, I think we think that November will have seen a contraction in, in GDP across the Eurozone, and we're probably going to see the world economy too, as showing when the figures come out, a bit of a slowdown, do maybe a reversal as well. So this is because of the COVID second wave and the lockdowns that have hit us. Uh, and in the UK, GDP remains well below February 2020 levels. Yes, it's recovered, but it's recovered uh, in a fast at the beginning, but now more slowly. Data which came out this morning, which is the Purchasing Managers Index, suggests that in fact, we've seen a contraction, as I said earlier, in November. And I would be astonished if that wasn't the case in places like Greece as well. Uh, so far, October uh, showed this figure. Unfortunately, when I did the slides, I did not incorporate the latest one, which just came out, which would have shown 45, uh, figure 45 instead of the 50 that is there at present. So a slowdown in November seems to be what's happening. What about Greece? When I mean, Greece had done quite well, as we know, economic growth was really quite, uh, you know, picking up. And um, for a while, there have been some quarters when Greece was the fastest growing country in the Eurozone, um, and there were good expectations of growth of maybe 2.5% in 2020, and a lot that had improved, of course, uh, also in terms of the credit rating of Greece and the expectations that uh, you know, life would be considerably easier uh, in the future uh, in terms of um, in the population having lived through all those restrictions in the, in the past that those are getting eased. I'm not talking about COVID, I'm talking about uh, the the bailout conditions that had been imposed on Greece. So it looked like there would be a serious light at the end of the tunnel and unfortunately then we had COVID and that's what's happened. This is a Greek industrial production. You can see the year-on-year -year data negative uh, through um, certainly the end of, of uh, from the end of the year and into uh, this year. Uh, Greece actually took very strict lockdown measures uh, which helped at the beginning in terms of controlling the virus and now of course they've had to reimpose strict measures uh, because uh, the number of cases has gone up following the summer probably lots and lots of brits coming over and lots of others for for on holiday um but um that of course has impacted on on growth there too and this is what the latest um forecasts are they were produced before the second lockdown in greece uh, but they still expected some pickup next year of perhaps 5%. If we hadn't had the news about the virus, I would say that probably uh, the minus nine this year was probably more or less correct. It may have been minus 10 because of the bad uh, data for this quarter, uh, which is likely to happen. But 2021 perhaps wouldn't be anything like as, as big as that because of the loss of investment and everything else. Um, however, with the vaccine, we're probably going to see all this forecast revised again. We have to wait and see how quickly the deployment of vaccines can be. Uh, but it is interesting that if you look at 
for the euro area overall, in this forecast, Greece was certainly above average, comfortably above average, which again gives you quite a lot of hope for the future. So what do we expect from governments? This is a general slide that I found somewhere which absolutely shows what's been going on. The, the beginning, everybody wanted to suppress the virus and help families, firms, make sure there's still money coming in for workers who weren't employed in any serious way at the time, but still stayed on companies' books. And then try and have as much recovery as possible, try and avoid the second wave, and then try and minimize the long run impact. Well, it hasn't quite happened. The rise in new cases has made that difficult. What it has meant is that everybody, as I said before, has been borrowing quite a lot, and this is what's happening in the UK. Now, this is relevant because uh, when you're looking at Brexit and what the implication of that would be, just seeing where we are likely to be even without Brexit is quite uh, you know, eye-watering. Uh, we are borrowing more than 100% of, of GDP. Remember where uh, Greece is at present, uh, and you can look at the forecast for the UK, where well, we're going to be at something like 140%, possibly, under some scenarios um of gdp by 2022 2023 and that may continue to go up um so we are like italy was uh which was considered to be the sort of uh, you know uh you know the problem for europe because it is quite large with a very very large deficit uh and sorry a very large debt to gdp ratio rather than deficit um but here uh we are going to be borrowing quite a bit this year maybe 400 billion and we will continue to borrow quite a lot in the year after. Greece has the, the advantage of also, also hopefully uh, getting quite a lot of the recovery fund that's available. And also, of course, the budget, which is quite substantial for the next seven years that um, Europe is trying to negotiate at present, which we know that the Hungarians and the Poles have voted against. Uh, but nevertheless, there's hope that this will all go through and they will, this will be deployed in productive sectors, plus, of course, supporting the health uh sector and um education people in employment the interesting thing is all this borrowing has happened uh paying very little in terms of interest you can see how fast interest have rates the yields on government bonds have fallen and that is of course because the banks have been willing to support it by massive purchases of, of bonds behind it in greece of course what has happened is that the european central bank is now buying greek bonds so actually the yield isn't hugely higher for 10-year bonds than the the uk one who would have thought of that uh, so the circumstances have changed very considerably what this suggests is that if one needed to borrow more even if brexit was a more of an issue for all of us um what we find now is that the markets are more willing to lend helped by the central banks so it is bearable from that point of view and that's worth uh worth remembering when we look ahead so where are we now well, since the withdrawal agreement, which was signed last year, uh, we've had a number of rounds of negotiations in order to uh, see what type of trade agreement we, we can have. I mean, remember, the agreement covered issues like the money, how much we're going to be paying over what period, because, of course, we've been contributing from the UK into all this but for, for so many years now. And the question is, how do we ease ourselves out of it? And what years do we pay for? Of course, it means that every country, including Greece, are left possibly uh, with a problem of how to fill in the gap that the UK will leave. The UK was something like 16% of the overall uh, contribution uh, to the budget, which is quite substantial. The question is, who takes up the slack? And do countries like Italy, Greece and, and, and Spain and the Southern European countries benefit perhaps from some redistribution, particularly in the budget towards them? The answer is yes, strangely enough. So it is more the richer countries, the bigger countries that uh, are taking some of that on. But of course, we, there were also issues of the citizens' rights, border arrangements, and also what type of sort of dispute resolution there might be. This is on the overall issue, which included, of course, Northern Ireland. It's been complicated since by the government's introduction of this, their controversial internal market bill, which is putting the whole Northern Ireland protocol into some sort of doubt, um, and COVID interruptions. I mean, uh, the main negotiator in the EU is, is, is self-isolating because someone from his team got COVID. And then remember, uh, 
if I remember correctly, quite a large part of the UK negotiating team had got COVID before. So we've had that. But, uh, you know, we can't hide behind that uh, necessarily because there's now urgency. So we carry on uh, with the various negotiations and there are signs now that maybe we will be agreeing various things. So, uh, but the negotiations are not very simple. There are 11 different areas in which those negotiations are taking place. There is huge amount of emphasis in terms of trade and goods. We hear a lot about that, uh, tariffs, non-tariffs and so on. And then of course, trade in areas such as fishery sector, uh, which is the, the sixth area that I'm, I'm highlighting there. Those have dominated, uh, but also, of course, we have the whole issue of the level playing field, which is number three, which is what uh, um, has uh, preoccupied the negotiators. The UK wants to be able to intervene and uh, subsidize particular sectors if it wants to and not be bound by state aid rules that were quite seriously imposed across Europe, forgetting, of course, that actually we were using trade uh, you know, state aid rules as an excuse quite often in the last few decades for not, in fact, supporting particular companies or sectors. And in reality, we spend a lot less on state aid that, than most of our competitors uh, in Europe. So it's not a serious issue, but nevertheless, it's a sort of taking back control issue. It's taken sort of quite some time for, uh, for any agreement to come through. Um, interestingly, we're way behind in the areas of services. Uh, that is very important for the city of London uh, and for the economy as a whole, frankly, because services are the one area of the economy that uh, is in positive balance of payments, balance, if you like. So we are in, in surplus uh, in our trade on services with the world and also with Europe and the financial services particularly and the standing of the City of London is seriously important. Leaving the EU, becoming a third country, means that you no longer have mutual recognition of regulation, and it means that uh, you have to fall back on something called equivalence, which means that you've got to have the type of regulation which the other side thinks is good enough uh, for financial stability, and if they decide that that's not the case, they can withdraw it with 30 days notice. Uh, that's a real problem for us and, and that may still be not completely guaranteed by the end of this negotiating period. Anyway, there is all this going on. So what we wanted to do is have a, a, a poll right now to ask you your, about your views of whether a trade deal, uh, a free trade deal or any trade deal against the no deal should be signed. Um, and Panos, I think you are going to come in now and suggested do i stop sharing my screen is that and what happens continue. you can leave the screen as it is all right and, uh, the audience now will receive the first poll uh, which is basically on on the trade deal and the transition transition period so so you should be able now to see the poll the first uh, question is how likely do you think it is if at all that the UK will agree a trade, a trade deal with the EU before the end of the transition period on December 31st. Very likely, fairly likely, fairly unlikely, very unlikely, and don't know. Some answers are coming in. I'll give it a minute, I would say, before we continue to the second question. So again, how likely do you think it is that the UK will agree a trade deal with the EU before, obviously, the 31st of December? Now, the second question is, do you think it would be a good or bad outcome for the UK to end the transition period out of the European Union without a trade deal? So is it really not having a trade deal good or bad? 
And again, multiple choice, a very good outcome, a fairly good outcome, a fairly bad outcome, and a very bad outcome. And of course, the no. And the final question is uh, mainly on the, the Brexit transition period. Uh, as part of the process of Britain leaving the European Union, is currently scheduled to come to an end on December 31st this year. Could you support or oppose extending uh, this transition period? So if no trade deal is reached with the EU, would you think this transition period should be extended or not? Couple of more seconds. And let's see actually the results now. Uh, Oh. Right, so how likely do you think it is? Very unlikely, uh, basically, the first the, the mm. first question. I think this is fairly consistent with, uh, you know, the general consensus, Vicky, isn't it? It is, although I have to say that uh, I would have gone for very likely. And, and the reason I would have gone for very likely is because uh, of all the slides that I showed you, uh, growth is going to be very important. I mean, if this government is going to have any chance of being re-elected, particularly since quite a lot of the, the regions uh, have actually suffered considerably because of COVID, more than, say, London, and because Brexit is likely to be adding to those problems and you just won't get the growth, they would really want to have some agreement uh, because otherwise the impact will be would be worse. Now they may, of course, not think logically, but if I were them, I would certainly go for that. And that's why I would have thought that they would do it, very likely. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm probably going to be proven wrong. And how can I disagree with, with uh, the Macedonian society? I'm sure. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. And this also basically links to the second question, because if uh, general consensus is that the, the not having a trade deal is a really bad outcome, then they yeah. try to get basically a trade deal. Uh, uh, yes, yes, but this is, this is the very sensible people who are listening to this again, rather than, I mean, we knew that not having a deal or even Brexit is a bad outcome anyway, so, uh, but logic doesn't seem to work. So 70%, 72% basically it considers uh, not having a trade deal as a very bad outcome and uh, only actually 3% fairly good, very good or fairly good. Now, regarding the extending the transition period, um, the majority believes that it's good actually, the transition period to be extended. What do you think, Vicky? Sorry, Vicky, I cannot hear you. Can you? Right, it's one of those problems with unmuting and muting. I do apologise. Just uh, one second. Yes, uh, as you know, the OECD has already said that, um, uh, it already suggested that there should be an extension of the transition period. Uh, the, the government decided against it. So uh, Boris Johnson in the summer said no in June. Uh, what they've now suggested is that we should at least stay for a bit longer in the single market in order to ease that, that, that issue. So um, it is possible that there will be some extension in the implementation that will, will come because basically we're not prepared, we're not ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we continue with uh, the presentation, what do you think? And then we have the second poll uh, at the end, or shall we proceed with some questions? It's up to you, Vicky. How, how right, you I, will, I will just carry on, and mm -hmm. then, and then uh, we go to, to, to the questions later. So, um, the bit of luck this start, um, mm. Did I stop sharing? No, we can we can see your uh, screen. 
Uh, this is it. Yeah, the screen was fine, it just wouldn't move. Okay, so so uh, we talked about, uh, you know, whether one is rational at all about this. So, uh, I mean, Brexit does indeed uh, make things work worse for the UK, and that's really the point that I was trying to make as well in terms of the reaction to uh, what people voted uh, in this, in the poll that we just had. Um, what most uh, estimates suggest is that we have already lost about 3% of GDP since the referendum, uh, and it's likely to be taking some one to 2% off next year. And given that we are desperate to see a recovery next year, uh, I mean, the, the, the expectation before the lockdown was that we would see a drop of 10% in 2020 and a rise of 7% in 2021. Um, but of course we had the lockdown, which will uh, lead to possibly an even bigger fall in Q4, as you see here, uh, which was forecast by the Bank of England. Um, that next year may well not be the 7%, it could be less than that. But it could be, I mean, as I said, the un huge uncertainty because of the vaccine, huge uncertainty in terms of what people may do in the meantime, but there are concerns that we might have another lockdown, perhaps while the vaccine is begin begins to be deployed at the beginning of next year. And if that is the case, then obviously uh, the Q1 figure we have here isn't going to be as strong as that. So every one to two percent that you lose is really quite significant, but that is very much the short term issue. The real worry is what happens over the longer term. This is, it's not just, I showed you the borrowing figures before, and the reason why they were important is that obviously with Brexit, the fiscal side suffers too. And what I'm showing here is estimates of what the impact by comparison to remaining, in other words, carrying on as we are now, even extending the transition period, extending the, the membership of the single market, what the difference is to a remain baseline uh, as a result. So. Uh, if you look at the government deficit itself, and I showed you that it could be going up to 18 or 20 percent, some 2 percent of that perhaps is, is going to be because of Brexit. So you could have had lower deficit to GDP ratio because of that. You will be collecting less corporate tax, less income tax because of lower growth, less VAT, and you'll be spending more uh, because you'll be growing more slowly. So your current expenditure would be greater, those fiscal stabilizers we all use. And if you look and what happens later in terms particularly of your debt to GDP ratio, that goes up quite significantly as well, because basically, because you grow less uh, quickly, you'd have to borrow more. So there are some serious negative impacts uh, coming out of, of Brexit, both in the short term and in the long term. And that is, of course, reflected in something that we call the Brexit Uncertainty Index, which the Bank of England has put together. And and that has shown how that index has moved up, uh, really was only created since 2016, although there was a lot of uncertainty before on how people were going to vote. But then uh, the issue is what type of Brexit we were going to have. Uh, and of course, it's been going up uh, recently. And, and that's the, the concern. You can see uh, how it's moved with particular dates where deadlines were missed or were about to to approach and so on. So that of course has a very significant impact on investment and investment has suffered throughout the whole period since uh, the, the Brexit referendum and hence why the calculations of two to three percent for uh, less GDP growth already by that time. And remember that even before the coronavirus uh, pandemic crisis, um, we were forecasting, or rather the Bank of England was forecasting growth of just 0.8% in 2020, and no more than anywhere between 1.2 to 1.5% to the end uh, of the a year, to the end of the current parliament. So we weren't doing very well, and to a considerable extent, it was because of Brexit uh, and the impact that this will have on investment and productivity. Uh, negative, in other words. Uh, so, so we started from a low base and coronavirus has made it worse. And what of course has happened, mainly because of the uncertainty, but also because uh, companies realized that perhaps with the ending of, um, I mentioned already, the, the passporting arrangements the, the, for the service sectors, for banks, um, you no longer have mutual recognition, you have equivalence. It means you've got to go and settle somewhere else as well to be able to sell to, to to Europe, but services as well. More generally, they, there has been an exodus of, of funds. So what this indicates is what the UK was investing in the other 27, how that was moving 
the number of transactions, M&A transactions, and also in greenfield investments, which was pretty similar to what the rest of the OECD, the rest of those sort of rich countries were doing in terms of their investment into Europe. What's happened since is that, particularly because there's been a bit of a slowdown in trade more generally, but while the OECD, which is the dotted line, have uh, sort of reduced the number of transactions in Europe and Europe was having difficulties in terms of growth. It didn't look that attractive uh, for a while for investment opportunities. From the UK, that number rose and rose very significantly, as you can see. That suggests that, that there's been an issue. Indeed, banks have been moving people across uh, to Europe. They've been moving uh, they've, been, they've been setting up subsidiaries in other centres uh, and also doing proper trading, which they have to do under European Central Bank uh, legislation as well to be allowed to operate. Uh, so that's, that suggests that, that there's mon money moving out of this country. So what is the expectation? Uh, you can see the forecast here, uh, which came from um, uh, partly looking at what the government had been uh, assuming, which is a reduction in UK GDP by 7.6%. Uh, if we have a no deal Brexit after 15 years, a bit less uh, with an FTA, 4.9% uh, decline, if you, we have a, a, a free trade agreement. But you can see the differences now. We put COVID on top, put the FTA Brexit, the free trade agreement, which doesn't cover services usually, and a no deal Brexit. And you can see, this is the quarters. Now, how, what do you do quarter after quarter from when we leave? Uh, and you can see that, of course, we fed we've left, then of course there was a bit of a decline because of the economy um, since in 2020, and then you can see the quarters. We resume growth and then flattening it, uh, of course, with COVID, um, and the impacts go away, but with FDA Brexit and with no deal, the gap between where we would be otherwise just widens, and that's a serious, serious issue for growth, and hence why we need to borrow more, why we need to spend more, why we receive less money in terms of, of taxes, because the economy does, does worse. So this is the, uh, the main reason for it, is trade and investment impact. The EU is the largest trading partner. You can see here how important Europe is uh, compared to the rest of the world. Yes, as a single country, the US is very large, but if you add all the European countries together, uh, it pales into insignificance. So Europe matters hugely, both for exports and for imports, and financial services, of course, are a major part of what we export and other services to the EU, as I have indicated before, and that's a serious issue for us. And then, of course, with services, you have all those barriers to trade. They're not tariffs, but they are non-tariff barriers, and you can see uh, how they, they become very significant there are still barriers if you're dealing within, a country, within the region, all sorts of barriers. You still need slightly different qualifications if you want to be, a, for example, a, a lawyer in France um, and so on. But there are serious problems if you are a third country. And you can see those, those restrictions really increasing. The highest is one. And you can see how even with air transport, because, of course, we now have open skies in, in Europe, but any other type of transport, but also in lots of other services, uh, you uh, are disadvantaged if you're on the outside. You have all these non-tariff barriers. On the, on, on the ones where there are tariffs, you can see the fall um, being very significant in particular sectors, uh, motor vehicles in particular, and I'll show you a slide that shows it. I mean, look what happens when you're moving uh, cars and parts out in and out of the UK, uh, and this is what happens in a single day. You can imagine if you add restrictions, if you add... Um, uh, the need to fill in forms, uh, if you have the need to check the origin of the goods you've got in there and how much is made in the UK, how much comes from elsewhere, uh, then you have a serious disincentive to trade uh, and uh, the blockages, of course, that we've also been hearing and a huge uh, lorry park in Kent anyway, which seems to be sort of inevitable. So uh, quite a lot of concern about what this will mean. People are now saying, oh, well, today's papers, um, we're going to start manufacturing a lot more things in the UK, so we don't need really worry an awful lot about whether we can import things or not, or whether anyone wants to buy things from us. Uh, we can do a lot of stuff here to satisfy the domestic market. Well, I think that's dreaming. Uh, so uh, that will affect, of course, imports. Maybe indeed we can uh, produce more of our clothes here. There's some suggestion already that maybe we can stop something like five billion worth of imports coming in from, from Europe. What we have done, in case there is a no deal, is already announced tariffs by Prozac Group. And of course, some of those affect Greece. Uh, 
these are the tariffs. Uh, they are particularly bad in relation to agriculture uh, and meat and so on, but they also touch on transport, cars and so on, textiles. Remember, there is a 10% external tariff uh, in, in the EU, so we'll be affected by that, but also they'll be affected if they're selling anything to us. Uh, and those are tariffs that will apply across, of course, under WTO rules. That's under no deal. Well, that will affect quite significantly what, uh, what Europe perhaps can export. And look what the EU does export. I mentioned cars already. This is the share of EU sector output which goes to the UK, either as an intermediate or final product, and it does matter. It may not be as large as a percentage of all exports that the UK sells, which is 45%. I think it's about just under 10% for Europe. But nevertheless, overall, uh, it's quite significant. And if you put all those tariffs on that I mentioned, then you've got a serious problem. Look at food products in particular, uh, where that would be an issue, but also right up at the top, uh, the car industry. So remember that slide I showed you that would be affected both ways. And even if we try then to have all sorts of deals with other countries, uh, the reality is that we're not going to make up for any loss in trade, both exports and imports with Europe. And what the calculations have been by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research is that if we move to a sing from the single market to WTO rules that I showed you before, in other words, no trade agreement, then uh, in the long term, we see a 32% reduction in goods, the 26% reduction in services. Uh, and that would be a sort of serious issue, overall minus 30, even if you have all these wonderful other trade agreements that we're signing now. Uh, not so bad if we move to FTA, to free trade agreement, but you see services just as bad as before, because of course there will be non-tariff barriers and the FTAs don't cover it. So uh, that's a serious issue. We can make up for it slightly by selling to others, the BRIC countries and also Australia and New Zealand. But as you can see, the difference is very small. So overall, we lose out and we lose out significantly. So the differences between no deal Brexit, FTA Brexit and COVID in the long term are very stark. Calculations from uh, the LSE suggest that the no deal Brexit is three times as bad as COVID. Um, and uh, that uh, remains in the long term. And that's why I think that uh, a no deal Brexit for me uh, makes very little sense. And my concern is that we might uh, have a very thin FTA, uh, which is still going to cost us a lot over the longer term. And, and that's an issue. And of course, if it's long term for us, it would be long term for Europe. And look at what happens with Europe. Um, the title said the impact of Brexit on, on Europe too, on the EU, not just on Greece. So uh, directly, but the reversal of integration after Brexit is likely to have an impact on income unemployment in the EU as well, whatever uh, agreement is reached because of those trading issues that I mentioned, but also of course there are movements of people and cooperation in science and innovation and so on. So you can see under WTO very substantial fall in output and employment, under FTA a bit less but still significant, under an EA, in other words if we stay like in Norway, uh, which of course remember is in the single market, uh, then of course the impact is a lot less. The chances of that are very, very small. So what does this mean in terms of countries? Um, it's interesting when you look at the share of EU country output, which comes here, you can see Greece uh, towards uh, the bottom there, but it's still uh, quite significant, just under 2%, so it does matter. But when you then look at it again, in relation to uh, the tariffs that I mentioned, um, and you weigh it by the tariffs, then Greece comes quite high up, it comes third on the list. So there is actually quite a substantial hit that Greece is going to have just from the, the goods export side where tariffs are uh, likely to be um, uh, imposed if there is a no deal Brexit. So there is a serious interest for all of us to, uh, to get something right in that area and to avoid no deal because those tariffs will then be imposed. What matters for Greece, of course, is also movement of people. There's a lot of Greeks here. I'm not sure how many we've counted, but um, uh, we know that something like maybe half a million young people have left uh, Greece is the financial crisis. There are loads of them here. Very vibrant Greek community uh, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, and of course, that uh, has gone down overall in terms of uh, inflow from the EU. There are serious issues about the Greeks who are here, they're studying or working, 
uh, who are trying to get pre-settled status or settled status and are worried about the movement. Uh, in the future, do they need a visa? How much will it cost? Do they need to pay more into the National Health Service when they use it? Because there is going to be a levy. Uh, all these costs are going to be uh, increasing. And the question is, uh, how does one actually manage to finesse it? So to sum up, um, we still have an unclear political path. Um, we've got another month um, leaving the EU without a deal. Uh, will have serious implications for growth. There are issues still on fishing quotas. We're still negotiating under those 11 strands of, uh, of issues that are happening right now. I think there will be an agreement, but who knows? You may be right that there isn't going to be. There will be quite serious um, um, sectoral and regional impacts of no deal, uh, as was uh, calculated by the government and pronounced by the then ex-chancellor uh, in, in, in a, couple, a couple of years ago, a bit less than that. Financial services are already mentioned, but Brexit has, uh, you know, costs for government and business in the UK and in the EU and in Greece, as I showed, under all business scenarios. And of course, COVID makes it worse. Uh, and the movement of people between UK and Greece, I mentioned already students, business people, I mentioned visas already, and costs, but also its acceptance of qualifications in the future, access to jobs, access to finance, voting rights. Uh, I mean, until now, an EU citizen could vote for mayoral, mayoral elections and also European elections. Well, obviously, uh, that's probably not going to be happening in the future and so on. So quite a lot of things to still sort out. I'm sure there are um, discussions between the Greeks and the Brits on how to make that a simple. Interesting enough, on the banking side, it's all down to individual country negotiations, quite a lot of bilateral agreements, whether it's to do with basic uh, banking and, and, uh, and lending operations. So, uh, you know, there could be lots of Greeks who are encouraged, uh, sorry, lots of British banks that I know the, British, the Greek government is trying to woo to uh, Greece under bilateral agreements right now. So let's see what happens there. Also investment banking for uh, you know, selling investment products to uh, the retail investor also is a bilateral issue. Um, so uh, th there are you know, some areas of hope, if you like, um, but also loads and loads of areas of concern. Um, but I would guess that the concerns are probably greater on the UK side than there are in Greece, because after all, all the Greeks could go into any of the other 26 countries, uh, apart from Greece, which are members still of the EU. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Vicky. I think uh, let's let's uh, continue with the second part of uh, the polling uh, experience. Uh, so basically, it's uh, on uh, the second poll is on immigration and global influence. Uh, and let me see how I can launch that poll. Actually. Mm. Yes. Uh, excuse me, I'm also new to uh, Zoom webinars. So I'm going to allow panelists to vote as well. And I'm going, going to launch the second poll. Uh, the first question is regarding immigration. So under new immigration rules due to come into force on January the 1st, EU citizens found rough sleeping could be deported from the UK if they refuse support like the offer of accommodation and uh, benefits from authorities. Do you su support or oppose this law? Uh, and again, five different uh, answers. Strongly support, somewhat support, somewhat oppose, strongly oppose, and don't know. Don't know. I guess immigration was also used uh, as basically a, a key benefit of, of for Brexit, actually controlling the immigration, uh, at least yes. So under new immigration rules, uh, EU citizens found, found rough sleeping could be deported from the UK if they refuse support. Do you support or oppose uh, this new law?
The second question is a bit more longer term. So thinking towards the next five to 10 years, do you think the UK will have more or less influence on global politics than they do now? Uh, or will it be no different? So more influence, less influence on global politics or, or no difference? And finally, I'm going to leave some, some more time actually to give your, submit your replies. And the third question, do you think the UK will ever rejoin the European Union? That's also an option <laughs> in, the, in the very long run, but uh, I think the de demographics will have to, to change uh, uh, quite a bit actually. So we have almost 75% of the uh, votes in. I'm gonna wait just a, a few more seconds. Okay, let's see the, the results. Immigration, so uh, it's split, isn't it? Uh, Strongly support 18%, some, somewhat support 36%, and then oppose, somewhat oppose 15, strongly oppose 30. Um, Panos, we can't actually see the oh. results on the screen. Uh, yes, yes, there you, there you are. It is. Uh -huh. That's interesting, somewhat support, that's interesting. Less influence, well, yes. And I'm really uh, rather pleased about the th number three. Um, <laughs> it will probably win. It or will. perhaps it's wishful thinking. Yes. Wishful thinking. But I mean, you often wonder, it, or people have been saying that, that uh, the Brits were always very difficult. So, uh, and they probably would not have even have allowed or would have played hardball with um, the recovery fund, for example. Uh, and uh, also increasing the budget yes. for the next um, few years. So, uh, and that, uh, isn't it good not to have them around? On the other hand, they were also uh, a balancing influence. So um, the, the fact that the audience, you know, is wishfully thinking that we should be yeah. rejoining uh, is, is, uh, is quite good news, suggests that we haven't necessarily tarnished our reputation completely. So. However, the question assumes the fact that they will be a European Union, uh, you know, in 10, 20 years ago. Uh, from, from yes, now. yes. So, so Brexit isn't going to lead to, to, to it breaking up. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so after Brexit, we all thought that would be now, you know, Greece is firmly in there and, um, and so on. So, so yes, I think people have said it's, it's wishful thinking. And I noticed in the question in the chat, so that some people may not have been able to see those questions. I don't know why I saw them fine. Uh, so yes, the questions are not uh, basically, they are only, uh, we can only list, see the full list of the questions. Uh, no, no, uh, yeah, I meant more the, the I, I'm guessing they meant the, the, the polling uh, questions, but maybe I've got that wrong. Uh, the, the polling is actually... Yeah, you know, it was on the screen, so it should have been fine. Yes. Exactly. So shall we move on with some questions? Yeah. Uh, so let me actually, let me see whether we, we have any raised hands. So if anyone, again, would like to submit, uh, you know, her or his question actually via the microphone, please select raise hand and I can give you actually, I can open the microphone for you. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with a few questions we have. Uh, a question from uh, Dimitrios Moniovis. Do you believe the UK government will focus on reducing debt after the pandemic is over and how it will do so? Increase in personal or business taxation, uh, capital gain tax, inherit inheritance tax or inflation? I guess he means probably by deflating uh, another debt. Uh, yes. 
Okay, um, so I can uh, try and answer that. Um, yes, they will focus on reducing debt at, at some point, and it will come probably not immediately, but in the next, uh, you know, in a year, in a year's time, depending, of course, on the on the speed of the recovery. And if indeed there is a vaccine and and things normalise faster than we think, then they will try and do that faster than than we think. Um, but I don't think they're going to fall into the trap that. Uh, George Osborne fell into, which is austerity. I don't think they can because, of course, what they they will need to carry on supporting sectors like the National Health Service, and of course they've already committed to be doing more on education, defence, and so on. And they're also committed to doing more in relation to infrastructure. They may not be able to do it all, but they are committed, especially if they want to be re-elected, since they want to level up and reduce the differences between London and the rest. Uh, so they will look at taxes. Uh, indeed, uh, there there are some anomalies around, so I think capital gains tax may well be looked at. Um, but also, uh, I'm suspecting, particularly if we're going to be going towards a greener environment, fuel duty, which simply hasn't been increased in the last ten years, could uh, could collect an awful lot. Um, inheritance tax, I don't think they would probably want to touch on that. Particularly, um, a business taxation. Um, corporation tax is being suggested as going up um, and uh, so which is which is I think likely I think it had been reduced far too much and by comparison to the rest of the world the rest of the advanced world we are quite low in terms of corporation tax so quite a lot can be done um, more difficult on the personal tax front although there could be issues of equalizing national insurance contributions for the self-employed with those of the employed person having seen however how badly many self-employed people have been affected there'll be a bit of a scream but um we'll see what happens but there could also be a reduction in in uh tax allowances for putting money into pension schemes uh, it could all come down to just 20 or 25 percent was one suggestion rather than 40 as you can now um so that will also raise a bit of money but at the end of the day if you really want to seriously reduce the deficit if that's what you want to do the deficit will be reduced simply because we won't be spending quite so much in all the, those uh, schemes uh and we won't be giving much stimulus to the economy additionally because of covid um but if we really want to have any major impact and then the calculations that we need possibly 40 billion extra raising of taxes every year then i'm afraid income tax will have to to be hit as well yeah. so yes i think something like that uh, will happen can i go to the next question which i just see down there which is what happens to a greek person who has the right to stay in the uk but has no national insurance number therefore no medical co cover yeah. it's really quite interesting because uh, quite a lot of greeks who've come recently um or anyone who's come into the uk during the covid crisis has not been able to get a national insurance number for the simple reason that the offices are closed so if you were to try and rung up uh, any anyone and try to get an answer, what you're told on the answer phone is that you can't get it. Uh, it may take quite a few months. Uh, we've been closed more or less, but you can work without one. And I know for a fact that people have been able to go and register the local um, uh, at, the, at the local GP without any problem, without having any of those numbers. So don't worry about that. I think, uh, as far as I can see, it's still. Uh, we're still covered, um, even without the national insurance, and uh, there is medical cover. There is another one uh, on uh, basically the, related to the Greek economy uh, by uh, yeah. John Cook. How should Greece spend the money they will be getting from the EU to revitalize its economy? Okay, well, the money coming in, of course, is in all sorts of different forms because there is the SURE fund, which is the one which is uh, helping with, uh, with employment issues. There's money coming in to help with the health side anyway. It's going to all the countries and the ones that have been particularly badly hit get, uh, you know, uh, e extra cash. Of course, Greece until now wasn't very badly hit, but it, it is now a little bit more. Um, but there is that cash coming in. And then in addition, we have the budget redistribution. Uh, which is going to favour the southern European countries. I mean, remember Greece also had extra problems, has extra problems because of the migration crisis that it has, uh, that it needs to deal with. So that money will be for them and also for uh, 
Italy and Spain that are receiving quite a few migrants. So there's that. And then, of course, there's the Recovery and Growth Fund or Recovery and Sustainability Fund. I'm not quite sure which of the two they're using right now. Um, and this fund is supposed to be used more long term. Uh, as we know, it's made up partly of loans and partly of grants. Uh, but it is meant to go into the productive sectors of the economy. So uh, the idea is that the EU and Greece, uh, or the Commission and Greece, agree those those, sec those areas between them and, and fund them. Uh, and if they do that, then obviously that's, um, uh, that could be you know, quite a positive a sort of agreement to have, which will mean that the money will go to the right areas and there will be extra support from the EU if things go well and all that sort of stuff. So there is a huge incentive in doing so. Now, of course, Greece has had a commission which is run by, it was run by Chris Pisaridis uh, and they developed an industrial strategy suggesting, you know, where, you know, the, the, the focus should be. Uh, and, and I think that is going to guide quite a lot of what goes on. Uh, but of course, Greece is quite strong or should be quite strong in the areas of renewables, for example, I mean, the green economy and so on, but also it needs to develop a lot of productive capacity in other areas, uh, such as manufacturing, possibly improve uh, uh, connectivity and, uh, and enhance, you know, trade. It is in a fantastic location. Uh, there's not just the Port of Paros, but there's a lot more that Greece can do in terms of being the sort of hub, if you like, for trade policies, for trade flows. So, um, uh, I think that's that's basically what the strategy is going to be. Uh, but I think the good thing is that there is um, willingness from the EU to see that happen, and at least there are plans uh, which have been drawn up already to have mm -hmm. to have help. Yeah. There is an interesting question on uh, on COVID, basically. So uh, by Mr. Georgis. All financial predictions or models are based on COVID-19 availability and effectiveness. What is the economy's plan B if there is a vaccine delay or any other issues related to vaccination process? Well, there is a problem uh, that it might take some time for the vaccines to be A, produced and B, distributed. And there was a particular concern because of the way in which uh, the, the first vaccine from Pfizer was meant to be stored, which of course required uh, deep refrigeration, which many countries didn't have. And also, even if it is the other vaccines that required a bit of refrigeration, I was talking to in another group to a GP earlier, uh, who said they don't have enough fridges anyway. They're full of flu vaccines and everything else. And where are they going to keep all that? So there is going to be a problem. And also, of course, every community and every country is going to try and and give the vaccine first to the people who they believe are more at risk. So there is a big issue of how quickly it can go to everybody. And also there is an issue of whether you can convince people to be vaccinated. There's a big debate right now about whether you're going to be insisting on having COVID passports um, and whether you can get away with that. I mean, given that there are executive powers now, anyone can, you know, any government can do what it likes for the time being. Perhaps it can force people to do that too. Uh, but they have failed in, you know, when you went to a restaurant, when the, um, the, the app was uh, introduced, the track and trace uh, app, uh, where at the beginning they almost threw you out if you didn't have that QR thing, you didn't have your code. Uh, then they gave up my experiences since I didn't have one that it was then very very easy to get into restaurants by just putting giving them your your number so I think it's going to be quite hard to 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 force them so that's going to be another delay so the plan B is that I think there's going to be more um, concern at the beginning of the year in terms of ensuring that at least the the spread of the virus is is under control and therefore there could well be some more lockdowns uh, it means that one would need to carry on borrowing until until certainly uh, you know the, the the end of spring. And what is happening in the UK anyway uh, is that uh, we are um, uh, we have extended the furlough scheme, supporting workers until the end of March, and lots of other things that we're going to finish in November have also been extended to then. So the assumption is we can still need to support the economy quite substantially until then. But I think what needs to happen is to look at what works and doesn't work and what is really spreading things. We haven't really had a proper impact assessment of all the, the, uh, the interventions of governments, frankly. Uh, I was reading something about Greece today, which suggested that you know, the, the, uh, the lockdown will indeed be eased. 
uh, whenever it's supposed to be used, which is again the, the 7th of December, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, because they're looking at all sorts of impacts. So schools don't seem to really spread it, certainly not, um, not primary schools. And so why do you need close them even during sort of quite strict lockdowns why retail shops and possibly why restaurants and so on um so hopefully whatever happens next in terms of a lockdown looks at that evidence a little bit more we should have collected quite a lot of it by now across the world uh, i've received a, an anonymous question it's quite old so let me let me go through it so the, the UK has already signed trade deals with countries outside the EU using EU's trade deals with these countries as a template. Trade agreements have already been signed with Japan, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, etc. Uh, a trade deal with Canada that will roll over uh, the terms of an existing agreement between EU and Canada has been recently secured too. Now the question is, how likely is the UK to sign a trade deal with Turkey at the same time when Europeans will be considering and possibly imposing sanctions to Turkey over provocations and illegal activities which violate Greek and Cypriot uh, sovereign rights in the Eastern Mediterranean? I don't know. I'm afraid this is a very, very difficult question. I think there are people in the audience, I know there are people in the audience who have been looking, have done a lot of work on the uh, Greek-Turkish uh, uh, issues um, right now, and, uh, and who are also concerned at times about uh, uh, Britain looking to be favouring Turkey over Greece in various aspects of, of, of diplomacy, if you like, and possibly also trade. Um, but I really can't 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 tell. But the interesting thing about all these trade deals, of course, um, I mean there is a, there is there are trade deals uh, that indeed exist between the EU and others. All we've done is replicate them for the time being. Even the Canadian deal we seem to be sorry. Yes, the Canadian deal we seem to have signed uh, will need to be refined next year. So at least we're rolling over what's happened there. Some of those may not be permanent because after a while if we are perceived to be the weaker side then we might lose out um, so uh, there's no real guarantee that those will remain just as they are um, but at least they allow a period of you know, breathing space uh, to to happen uh, but on the Turkish front uh, I really would leave it to someone else I, I just can't answer it absolutely. because I just don't know how to answer it absolutely absolutely uh, maybe last question, Vicky. If, if, uh, sure. Yes. Uh, by Mr. Potidis, would it would it be possible to transfer the private UK pension scheme uh, to an EU country, and what what will be the impact on those schemes? Mm. Quite specific. Uh, yes. Well, this is very very interesting. Uh, that is because one is worried about uh, uh, what may happen. Uh, well, can you transfer a UK pension scheme? Um, uh, well, a number of the of the um, uh, pension providers, by which I mean private pension providers, are quite international, and of course they invest in all sorts of different uh, places and European equities and and so on. Um, and and quite a lot of people have pensions which they um, manage to collect uh, while they were working in in other parts and what is happening with all those is that you get your pensions as they get sent back to you from all those countries where the pensions have been accrued if you like uh, because actually even though we were in the eu uh, the reality is there isn't a single capital markets yet across europe so and there are different rules and regulations that exist in terms of uh you know how your pensions are treated what the tax um, um, regime is in terms of um, doing uh, what it's supposed to be doing in terms of encouraging you or otherwise in terms of investing uh, into your pension scheme. So it varies from country to country how 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 incentivized people are. So in terms of, I'm not a financial expert from that point of view, uh, I'm sorry to say, but of course now in the UK you can just take your pension out uh, above a certain age uh, you can basically liquidate it and then put it wherever you want uh, once the appropriate sort of tax been arranged and whatever it is that you've taken out. 
and then you can do what you like with it of course and you can go and invest and have it somewhere else if that is what you want to do um what it means for the longer term and uh, it's depending on, on the amount of money you invest in where and so on and the country in which you have invested it in and whether the rules are such that then they allow you to be extracting the benefit back into the UK as it was or whether there are extra taxes that are being imposed. So as I said, it's not a single pension market, unfortunately, across Europe. Uh, and that will need to be very, very carefully looked at if someone decides to, to do anything of the sort that I've just described. Maybe one more last one that just came uh, came by uh, by uh, Mrs. Nomikos. Will there be tariffs on agricultural products from Greece? And if and if yes, how they are going to be imposed? I guess Will there be tariffs? Yes. Yes. Well, as I, uh, if we have a a deal, no. If we have if we don't have a deal, I already showed the the tariffs that exist. Then yes. In fact, on some. On some products, uh, I mean, that's, our tariffs weren't particularly high. I mean, the real problem is the tariffs that the EU imposes against us. So basically, we have imposed much lower tariffs uh, in our tariff schedule uh, of when um, the, if we have a no deal Brexit. So, so they will indeed be imposed. So a tariff will be paid uh, possibly on entering. So the price of, of whatever we're importing is going to be going up by that amount. Now, of course, any Greek exporter could decide to reduce their own price to remain competitive um, if they really want to have a sizable uh, presence in, in, the, in the UK market. Well, Vicky, thank you very much. You are a true friend of the society and always eager to help us educating ourselves and our audience on key issues. So you, you were with us in 2015 and 2017 discussing the European debt crisis and the aftermath of the Greek economy also last year and in this occasion to help us understand the Brexit, what Brexit uh, will mean to us. I'm sure we'll see you very soon, hopefully, discussing another topic this time, as we all hope for a fair and mutually beneficial, beneficial resolution on this uh, Brexit matter soon. So once again, Vicky, on behalf, on behalf of the Executive Committee, we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you for having asked me. I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and uh, I'm, it's a shame we can't see each other face to face with all the people who are participating. And thank you for the questions, which are, I can see all the ones I haven't answered and they're really difficult ones. Thank God for that. So uh, thank you very much for participating so well. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank our Vice President, uh, uh, Mrs. Natasha Svejuri, our Special Advisor to the Board, Mr. John Karas and the members, of course, of the Executive Committee for all their help on organizing this seminar. Finally, a great thank you to you, our audience, for attending and actively participating in today's event. Good evening, and we hope to see you soon in our next, probably online again, event. We wish you well, and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. Bye-bye.